Hi, in this tutorial, I will show you how to solve unsteady Navier-Stokes equations using Phoenix. Um, so in the previous tutorial, we went over a steady solver. Here, I'm going to consider an unsteady version of that, and uh, which is basically same equation, but considering the partial u partial t term. So now the simplest implementation for an unsteady Navier-Stokes solver is the original uh, uh, splitting method uh, proposed by Alex Chorin in the late 60s. And uh, that's the, uh, the tutorial available on the Phoenix website. So I'll provide a link here. And this is often the simplest uh, uh, form of a Navier-Stokes solver that's you know easily understandable for those who have uh, some understanding of fine elements. But uh, in practice, from my experience, this solver here works well for a simple 2D problems. But if you go to 3D problems, it usually doesn't work so well. So you need a more robust Navier-Stokes solver. So another solver that's more robust is the so-called IPCS method, incremental pressure correction scheme, which very broadly is similar idea to, to, um, to the operator splitting uh, method of Turing, but it, it basically provides a more robust and more accurate uh, version of that. So this is what I'll go over today. So the code that I'm going to use is also taken from one of the tutorials that's uh, uh, provided here. I'll provide a link to here too. And um, so uh, I'll go over this code, the IPCS method. Uh, and um, But I should tell you that this specific implementation of IPCS that we'll go over today is a uh, bit naive implementation of IPCS and um, a more robust and accurate implementation is also available in Phoenix, which is based on the o software OSIS, which I'll talk about later in uh, later tutorials. For this specific case uh, that I'm gonna talk about today works perfect for 2D problems, uh, uh, and but in unsteady 3D complex problems, you probably wanna use a little bit more robust version, depending on how complex, of course, your problem is. Okay, so let's go over this code. So uh, this is the code that I'm going to walk you through. So uh, first, what I'm going to do is that I have some data for my inlet boundary condition because here I'm dealing with a transient problem. So in this file here, <coughs> I have an array that defines time. So this is basically the times, different times during the unsteady problem that I'm solving and the corresponding velocity values that I have here. So there's another array that's the corresponding velocity values. So in this case, I'm solving for a pulsatile blood flow problem in an aneurysm. So here I have three cardiac cycles. So roughly each one being equal to close to one second. And then the corresponding velocity profiles at the inlet, the velocity back magnitudes. So I scale the velocity to 50%. So I use, I'm using a smaller than usual velocity at the inlet. And that's because I wanted to solve this in a coarser mesh with a coarser time step. So I can you know, get solutions faster. Uh, okay, so here's the main code that in, from this line, we import the inlet data. We correspond how long we're gonna run the simulation. So this is three cardiac cycles. So capital T divided by three is one heartbeat in this case. I define my time step, the, to the total time divided by the number of time steps. In this case, I have 30,000 time steps. So that's uh, 10,000 time steps per each cardiac cycle. I'm defining the fluid properties. Here I'm creating a mesh. So this is an idealized aneurysm that I create by, by adding a rectangle and a circle. So by adding this tube and aneurysm representing a, a channel and a, you know, a circle, I create my domain and then I can mesh. And the higher, if you make this 100 larger, you'll get a finer mesh. If you make it smaller, you get a coarser mesh. So in this example, I'm gonna use first order elements, uh, but oftentimes when we do a, uh, uh, unstabilized Navier-Stokes solvers, we use P2P1 elements, so second order elements. But the nice thing about this Turing type methods is that even with P1, P1 elements, meaning that you use first order elements, you still can get away in most applications to get a stable, nice solution, even without any stabilization. Whereas if you use the coupled momentum method that's offered in certain open source fine element CFC solvers like CMAS, you absolutely do need uh, stabilization if you use first order shape functions. Okay, great. So here I'm defining my vector function space, function space for velocity. Q, which is a linear space, is a function space for my pressure. So this is not vector, it's a scanner. And I define my inlets and outlets. In this case, uh, this is a domain that I have. Uh, 
which I've created. So my inlet, I just define it use it here. And then the outlet, I also define. And the walls, I here I define pretty easily by defining them to be on the boundary and either greater than a certain y value or less than a certain y value. So that, that way easily I can pick up the, the boundaries. In later tutorials, I'll show you how you can tag your boundaries if you have more complex geometries. Okay, then I define my boundary conditions for the walls. I have zero, it's a 2D problem. So my I have you know zero x, zero y, so that's kind of like a vect vector. I have constant scalar zero as my outlet boundary condition for pressure. So that's tagged to outflow. The no slip is tagged at the walls. And then I group my boundary condition for pressure to BCP. Uh, and then I also use uh, my boundary conditions. I group my boundary conditions later for velocity two. And then I define my trial function space and test function space. So you use the trial, the trial functions, we use the test or weight functions for velocity. And then P is the pressure and Q is the corresponding test function for pressure. So in this case, I have, uh, it's an unsteady problem. So I have also the previous time step. So the underline underscore N is my previous time step and U underscore is the current time step. Same thing for pressure. And then I define uh, the normal uh, vectors, which I can find like this, which I need in my weak form. And I define all these constants. And I define epsilon, the symmetric part of the velocity gradient. I also define my stress tensor. And then I go into my weak forms. So this is the three-step method. So broadly, in these types of training type method, the first step is a tentative velocity update, which you basically ignore the, the uh, continuity. The second step, you project you find pressure such that you project the solution to a divergence-free space. And in the third step, you update the velocity that accounts for inc uh, uh, incompressibility. So now these are the big forms corresponding to each step. Um, I will in the future create a tutorial that I'll walk through the theory of solving Navier-Stokes equations with different methods, starting from the simple Chorney method to the more complex IPCS method. So I'll talk about these uh, weak forms, how they're derived, in more detail in later tutorials. But for now, we have these three steps. We can assemble the left-hand sides into matrices. Here I'm applying the boundary condition for pressure and can define my files that I want to save. And I can also save time series. So you don't need to save a single file for every time step. You can save all your time steps in a single file, which is pretty nice. Uh, and then here, it's an unsteady loop. I'm looping over all my time steps, and then I'm reading uh, the, the velocity. So I can interpolating based on the time arrays that I have and the time that I'm at, so I know what's my velocity at the end. So, so here I'm using NumPy interpret to do that. And then I assign my digital boundary condition to inlet. So here I'm grouping my velocity boundary conditions, which was inlet that keeps getting updated because it's unsteady, and the wall boundary condition, which is just constant for all time steps. So it doesn't need to get updated. So here I assign the boundary conditions and I solve the three steps. So this is step one, which I solve using a GMRS solver, step two, and then step three, the uh, velocity correction step, which is a, a simplest one. So I can easily just use a conjugate gradient solver. Uh, then I can tell it how often I want to save my file. So here I'm only saving the last cardiac cycle. And also I'm telling it every 500 time steps, save my velocity. I'm not saving pressure here. And then I update the previous time steps with the solution, and I go to the next time step. And I can also print uh, useful information like the maximum velocity, the time step that I'm at, so I can you know, visualize them at, in a log file. OK, then here's the job file that I uh, created. I'll also post this job file. Um, so then, uh, so here I've set the maximum time to 20 hours, but you know, I didn't really need that long of a time. Uh, and then you can tell how much memory you need. In this case, I used one node with 24 processors. So you can specify that here. And then I call my Python uh, code and I write the log file to log that out. So I can, you know, uh, with tail dash F command, you can visualize your log file in real time as that log file is being created when you run your job file on your cluster. Okay, so I've already done this, and here is the results. So if I load it in Pairview, I can um, 
see my velocity profile, so I can play this. So this is one cardiac circle that I saved. So you can see the unsteady profile. You have jet entering the aneurysm, and you can see how the flow changes during one cardiac cycle. So you can navigate different time steps, or you can play it and get different information. I can also do the streamlines. So if I add surface that I see, I can go back and play, and can I see how my vortex you know, changes during a cardiac cycle for this kind of low Reynolds number uh, aneurysm flow. Um, uh, okay, 